Genesis 1, verse 1 through to 2, verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let's make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he'd made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I noticed on the ABC website in the last week uh, that they've finally produced vegan tuna. That's tuna-free tuna, called tuna. Uh, they've managed to put it out there, and there was a terrific article on the ABC website uh, where they interviewed a vegan activist. And the vegan activist said, uh, we need to change the way we do our labelling on food. We actually need a suffering component. Uh, I checked if it was April the 1st. It wasn't. Uh, this man was serious. So everything produced that you buy will have a new label on it, uh, if this activist's plan gets up, in which there'll be a suffering quotient based on how 
uh, animals, livestock, insects have suffered to produce that food for you. Uh, it got me thinking uh, in a number of different directions, and uh, I thought, what, what's the worldview behind that? Because it's not my worldview. That's not the way I look at the world. I don't pick up a packet of sayos and look at the suffering question and think, what suffered to produce these sayos for me? Uh, with this sermon in mind, I thought yesterday, I thought, why don't I sit down and read through the Saturday papers, the Herald and the Australian, so I'm balanced, and as I do that, why don't I look for some statements that stand out that produce a way of viewing the world that I'm not familiar with? Uh, let me share three with you. Uh, this was a quote from a movie review from a character in a movie. This is what the character said, I'm alive, that's enough. That's an interesting worldview, isn't it? Here's one from Nigella Lawson. We all know who Nigella Lawson is. She's on MasterChef this next week. Let me just tell you that. Uh, this is what she said in an interview. You know how the world works. Equality happens by everything getting worse and not some things getting better. That's an interesting way of looking at the world, isn't it? Here's one from an article in the opinion section of the Sydney Morning Herald talking about Izzy Folau and religion and the federal election. Quote, organised religion always ends up being about love's opposite, power. Now, there are four examples of worldviews, aren't they? We've all got a worldview, whether we know it or not. A worldview is a very simple idea. It's the map I've got in my head and my heart that helps me navigate the world. It's the map I've got in my head and my heart that helps me navigate the world. It's made up of all these truths, ideas, facts that I've cobbled together so that when I wake up and go out into the world, I know how to make my way, make decisions, make sense of what's there. And that's matched by another big word with a lot of syllables, presuppositions. You'll see it there on your outline under point one. Because every worldview is based on presuppositions. Now, that's a big word uh, for a simple bloke like me. Let me break it down. They're kind of prior held beliefs that are the foundation for my worldview. I, I know them to be true, I just can't always prove them. Let, let me give you an example. Part of my worldview is that the Bible is the Word of God and reveals God. Worldview. There are some presuppositions behind that. God speaks, God uses words. God reveals in his words and God can be trusted. So there's a worldview and there's some presuppositions that sit under it, that form it for me. I, I find it very helpful when it comes to these things to think about chocolate because there was a television ad that made all this very clear to me a, a long time ago. It was an ad associated with Cadbury's chocolate. You all know where I'm going, don't you? And it featured a man with a lot more hair than me called Julius Sumner Miller. Uh, he would introduce the ad with some very significant scientific fact that didn't interest me. And then he'd ask that very important question. What was it? Do we know what it is? Why is it so? Then there was a link made to how nutritious and tasty Cadbury's chocolate was, and I was so. Why is it so? That's the question every worldview must answer. That's the question I've got to ask of any worldview. When I see tuna free tuna, why is it so? What is this saying about the world? How does it answer the questions that I'm going to face today? That's the question at the heart of Genesis 1 to 12. Why is it so? Why is it so? For us as people who wear that label Christian, this is part of our worldview. In fact, some people would go, and I, I'm part of them, uh, this is a central plank in our worldview, especially Genesis 1. Why is it so? Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Lord, it's marvellous to have heaters this morning and the Bible open in front of us to sit amongst a commonly minded group of people. Thank you for bringing us to this point today. Thank you for planning the rest of the day and the rest of the week. But, Father, as we listen to your word now, as we delight in what your word reveals, help us not to be apathetic or to be overly familiar with a passage that we've heard so many times. 
Help us by your word, by your spirit working through your word, to think about our worldview and the world's view of itself. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline, always wise as you start a new project. It's probably the step I don't take uh, to sit down and get a lie of the land and uh, make some general observations before you get into it. I, I want to lay out just very quickly six quick observations about Genesis chapter one and the book of Genesis before we get into it. Uh, the first observation is there, we've actually opened the book and read it. I, I think that's a very important fact, isn't it? We've actually sat here listened to these words being read, and then said, this is the word of the Lord. That tells you a lot about how we view this book, doesn't it? At least as a community. Moreover, it tells us something about how we view God. This is God's word. God speaks. And when people speak, they reveal stuff. Which leads to the second observation, this speaking has been written down, Genesis is literature. I don't know what your favourite subject at school was. English mightn't have been up there. But whatever else you think about English, Christianity is a religion of a book, isn't it? We have sat here with a book open and then said that was God speaking. So we've got to deal with a book that has been written down for us. Now, often it's strange and seems far separated from our world, but it's literature, and like all literature, it's got to be read in a certain way, which leads to the third observation. It might sound like a cop-out, but it's not really. The literature of Genesis is really hard to classify. There are a whole lot of options that people give. Uh, It's history. It's a myth. It's one long hymn. It's a poem. And more often than not, when people use those categories and whack Genesis into some silo or pigeonhole, they're using it to say, well, you can't really take it as the truth. I mean, you don't read poems to get truth, do you? You don't listen to the Norse myths and talk about Thor in order to get some true understanding of the world. I think that's a cop out. Because all literature will reveal some truth And just defining it as a certain type of literature doesn't mean you can dismiss it. Hands up here if you've ever heard of a poet called Wilfred Owen. That's terrific. I'm really heartened. Uh, Wilfred Owen didn't survive the First World War. Wilfred Owen experienced the First World War. Wilfred Owen knew what it meant to have a mustard gas attack and fumble for your gas mask as your mates are dying. Wilfred Owen knew what it meant to live for weeks in mud and water in a trench. Wilfred Owen knew the feeling when ice gripped your guts as you're about to go over into no man's land. And he reveals all that truth in poems. Literature communicates truth. All type of literature handled correctly can do that. Now, the presence of Genesis in the Bible helps us with that. That's the fourth observation. It's a book amongst a whole lot of other books. The fact that it's in the Bible tells us that it's surrounded by all this other stuff, all these other books that will help us understand it. In fact, when you trace it through, and we'll do this at the end, when you trace it through, it appears in all sorts of places. When the early church is being set up in Acts, when Paul is writing to a bunch of God's people in the greatest city of the world in Rome, when there's a dysfunctional church being rebuked in 1 Corinthians, when Jesus is asked questions about marriage and divorce and uh, who should I pay taxes to? There's Genesis right throughout the Bible. And let me tell you, every time it's used, the people who are using it regard it as history. Not myth, not a hymn, not a poem, but history. Laying out the real historical foundation for our understanding and navigation of the world. Observation five, every piece of literature has an author. We we know that this is God-breathed, but it's also written by a bloke. Up until 250 years ago, uh, that was thought to be Moses. Jesus thought it was Moses. The Old Testament thought it was Moses. The New Testament thought it was Moses. I'm a simple guy. I'm going to go with Moses as writing the Old Testament part that we're looking at at the moment, which brings me to the last point. We've got an author. We've got literature. We've got a book. We're paying attention. Every piece of literature has a purpose. 
Now, Genesis is in the first five books of the Bible and as a whole they seem to be looking at what's God going to do with a world that's mucked up. And Genesis is at the start of that, if you like, without giving us a heading or a title page or a sign by the side of the road, Genesis is about the beginning, the failure and the promise of creation. The beginning, the failure and the promise of creation. Or another way, this is what the world was, this is what's happened, this is why the world is. That's the purpose of Genesis. And listen to how it starts. I'm at point three on the outline, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's always important to be clear about what you say and what you don't say. This is one of the great experiences I've had from coaching a soccer team. You give an instruction, you think it's clear and then everyone does something else. That's the way it works. It happens in all parts of life, doesn't it? Uh, in work, in family, in leisure. Always need to be clear about what has been said and what hasn't been said. These verses set out some really important truths that are very clear. Uh, if you remember your English, God is the subject. God does everything. Did you notice that? In the beginning, God. God is the one that does the verb. He doesn't have the verb done to him. God instigates, God creates, God alone does that and that means that God exists before all this happens. He is pre-existent. Did you notice the way things are described there in verse 2? Everything is formless and empty, literally a desert and a wasteland. There is nothing there. There is nothing there. And thirdly, do you notice God's not separate from it all? Did you notice that there in the end of verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the walls. He's distinct. He's different. But it's not as if he's standing back with a remote control. He's there. He's there. Now, it's also important to see what's not being said. Did you notice that there's no war or chaos or fight to the death? Did you notice there's no battle? or violence there in the first two verses? Did you notice too that it's not like Lego Masters where you, know, you have the big storeroom full of all these bricks and you can go in and grab the bricks and make the world? There's nothing. Ex nihilo. God hasn't got tools. God doesn't have wood. God doesn't have steel or sticky tape or wire. God doesn't have Lego, God's got nothing and God creates. God creates everything from nothing. Now if we stop there, that's a pretty big worldview, isn't it? There are some pretty big foundational presuppositions behind that. God pre-exists, is the sole creator, intimate with but different from creation and out of nothing. That's Six fairly big statements. But it doesn't stop there, does it? We're on point four on the outline and three through 31 then unfolds what happens as God creates, and kind of like from a God down look. And there are patterns right throughout it, aren't there? If you like patterns, this is a place for patterns. Did you notice that as everything is formless and empty, then the process of creation deals with that? A superstructure is whacked up and then filled. Uh, we've really enjoyed watching what's happening on the corner opposite the Catholic school there. That someone's building a house. And, and you see the structure go up and then you see the structure filled in and now I'm wondering how big is the telly going to be? What kind of car is going to be there? What, what kind of lounge suite? That's what's happening here. There's emptiness, it's formless, it's a desert. God builds a superstructure and then fills it. And as he does that, do you notice what's going on? Days 1 and 2 and 4 and 5, single commands. Days 3 and 6, two commands. So your attention's drawn to certain days and the things that happen and what God's doing. And within each day, there's a pattern we're all familiar with, isn't it? As you go through each day, there's an introduction. God said, there's a command, let there be. There's a report, it was, a, an evaluation, it was good. And then a time marker, evening, morning, every day. 
and a pattern and a rolling. Or, now, when you read that, is it chaotic? And that rhythm and that pattern is meant to create an impression as you read it so that you go, there's a purpose here. There's an order here. There is stuff happening the way it should. And the dominant figure is who? It's God. But do you notice that God relates? He interacts with the created world. Why don't you oceans go and team? And then he relates to humans. Why don't you humans go and bear my image? And so when you look at creation, it's not flat. It's not formless. It's not random. It's not violent. But it's structured in an order, if you want, in a hierarchy. Let's have a closer look. The, the first three days, we're building the superstructure. Day one, creation of light is distinct to darkness. Day two, creation of the sky. Day three, creation of the land and the sea and the vegetation. We've now got the form. The form needs to be filled. And day four sees the creation of the lights, doesn't it? The lights to populate the sky, uh, the light and the dark, the sun, the moon and the stars are set up. Uh, we've really got the cosmic streetlights created, haven't we? That's what's happening here. They're functional. And do you notice that they serve creation? Now, if we pause there, Athena Star Woman's got a problem, doesn't she, at the back of New Idea? Because she looks at these things and she says, because these things are doing certain things this week, your wage is going to go up and you're going to meet someone special. But God looks at them and goes, you're streetlights. You mark time. You provide light into the creation that I'm making. You're not deities that structure the goodness of life, predict what's going to happen, influence decisions. Day five, well, we see the creation of the birds and the fish. Did you notice the language there in verse 20? Did you see the way in which God commands, let the water teem with living creatures? How often do we use that word teem? It's a good word, isn't it? It's an abundant word. It's a word that is bountiful and full and kind of creates all sorts of images of all these things tumbling out trying to get into the creation, making the noises and the colours and the sounds. And do you notice that when God does that, it's not chaotic, uh, it's bountiful, it's teeming, but it's to kind. And then God says... I'm going to bless you. Go be fruitful, increase and fill. God's not a stingy creator. God's not restrained in his creative action, is he? And day six adds to that teeming animal population as God turns to the land animals. And again, you have this idea, almost as if you can hear all the snorts and the grunts and the running and the hoofs and the, the groans as the animals rush out into the world. Now, before we go any further, what, what kind of worldview are we getting? What are the presuppositions, the foundational blocks? Well, there's an order there, isn't there? There's a purpose. There's a fact that you can sit and watch and see how things relate. That you can see that there's commonality here and difference there. That things happen in a pattern. Now, where, where does that lead in our world? It leads to places like Proverbs and Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes and science, maybe, where I can observe and what happens in God's creation reveals. The climax of the sixth day for many and for the whole creation account for many is the creation of humans. It's a focus of the creation account because everything seems to slow down from verse 26. Uh, that part of the six-day creation, uh, it kind of gets more words, more focus, more conversation than any other part. Uh, it's the first time in the account that God talks to himself, where God deliberates, let us make, as he looks at everything in verse 26. Now, you've got to notice that little word, don't you? That it's plural. Most people pick that up. What does that tell you about the nature of God? That God talks to himself? Well, no, God's community, relational, within himself, not just with stuff out there. 
and then he makes man in our image. And do you notice how the singular and the plural mix there in verse 27? Man, man and woman, male and female, reflecting God, community together, not the same as God, but pointing towards him, gendered equal in the image of God, but different to each other. Now we get a little bit of clarity there in verse 26 about what it means to be made in the image of God. Do you notice that once man is made in the image of God, male and female, what's the consequence in verse 26? Rulership. So you have this order in creation of God the creator speaking creation into his order, kind to kind, with humans made in his image to be his rulers over it. And as God steps back, if you like, What's his assessment there of creation in verse 31? Well, we've moved into superlatives, haven't we? Not just good, what is it? It is very good. It is good to have everything in its kind, in order, and at this point, with humans there, ruling under God in his image, equal but different, it is very good. Now, if we stop there, that's a big worldview, isn't it? There are some big presuppositions there that underpin it. Creates a fairly unique picture of humanity as some people in the West picked up this morning. Humans are distinct and over creation. They're special, they're relational, they're gendered. They're a delight to God. They've got a purpose. There are two of them equal in their image of God created differently. But when you play that down, this is why we can vote next week, isn't it? This is a heart of democracy that we've all got equal value and so everything, well, you should express your opinion in changing the government. Here's where democracy starts. Here's where racism finishes. Because all humans are made in the image of God. Here's where slavery stops because no one should own another person. Here is where our view of welfare and dealing with each other as bearing the image of God will begin. Here is where we look at those who are broken and say you are special because you are made in God's image. Here is a place where relationships are valued and loneliness is recognised as often bitterness. Here is the place where humans are regarded as having a purpose and it's not in a PlayStation. Here is the place where people are told that life is not about nihilism or apathy, but about bearing the image of God. That's a big worldview, isn't it? It doesn't stop with the humans, though. Have you noticed that? I'm at point five on the outline. It ends with rest. Verse 1, chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, and by the seventh day God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work, and God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he'd done. As repetition there, 1-1 one, one, and 2-1, the heavens and the earth have been created. God's exhausted, so he needs a bex and a good lie down. That's not what the rest is here, is it? The rest here is actually the climax where God enjoys what he's made, not in exhaustion, but in delightful provision. God's rest is the rest from creative work, not the rest from sustenance. When Jesus talks about God working in John 5, 17, he actually recognises that God is still working, not in creating, but in sustaining what he's created, and by then it's fundamentally broken. This is the pinnacle of creation, rest. The day that doesn't end. There's no evening, there's no morning. This is the purpose of creation, that God, the creator, who speaks everything out of nothing, will rest with his creation and those who bear his image, and that is unique. That's the purpose of creation, the pinnacle. Now, if we stop there and look at the world, How are we going with rest? Our world is relentless in how 
lacking in rest it is, isn't it? Well, I've just had a holiday, but I don't think I'm rested. Don't confuse holidays with rest. Whenever we look at our world at the moment, we see people being busy. We see people trying to create their own universes. We see people who don't know what it means to rest, and so in our hearts there should be a, why is it so? There is something broken because we don't rest. Well, let me finish at point six by highlighting some presuppositions and quickly summarising a worldview and then finishing very briefly with some consequences. Let me go to those presuppositions. You know those ideas that are the foundation for a worldview? What have we learned? Let's say, let's pick something around. About the character of God here. Here are some things that I picked up. God pre-exists. God creates. God reveals. God speaks. God uses words. God sustains. God relates. God is intimate with his creation but distinct from his creation. God rests, God judges, God names. I don't think I've exhausted what we learn there about the character of God, have I? Is that your picture of God? The process of creation is significant. Do you notice that it's not out of a battle? It's not by chance or randomness. It's not that the weak or the impractical get eliminated in death. It's not by conflict. God speaks in an orderly, kind-to-kind way and creation emerges from nothing to rest. Is that the way we view creation? Where might those presuppositions actually lead us? The nature of creation is a hierarchy which is delightful. It's got a purpose. Things are made according to kind with a role in an order. Humans are made equal but different, male and female, reflecting the image of God but gendered. Where might those presuppositions lead us? What about the worldview? We've dealt with presuppositions. What about the worldview that emerges? Uh, it's fairly complex and large if we want to map it all out. Let, let me just paint five little parts of the web. Uh, God's the creator of the world by word. God creates a good physical world. Humans, man and woman, are created by God in his image. Humans occupy a very good place in God's creation. Rest is the purpose of creation. At every part of those five strands, that worldview confronts our world's view of itself, doesn't it? At every part. To be someone who opens the book of Genesis and reads Genesis 1 and says this is the word of God is to be someone who holds a view of the world that is confronting. that looks at the world and says, what worldview do you have? Why is it so? Where are you going? What is your purpose? Now, the consequences of those presuppositions and that worldview are significant. Uh, My favourite lecturer um, amongst a number at college was a a bloke called Mark Badley. Uh, Mark Badley is now lecturing up at Queensland Theological College. I think Neil and Steph had him there. He's a big bear of a guy with a beard, uh, just a brain the size of a universe. There were a number of really endearing qualities about Mark Badley. Uh, The first was every 8 a.m. lecture, he'd start with a can of Coke. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Glug, 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 glug. Now to the word of God. The other endearing quality was the questions he asked you. And you'd say something and you think you had it sorted out and then Mark would gently lead you and say, Did you want to end up here? Because if you start there, that's where you're going to end up. It's a very helpful way to think, isn't it? If I start here, where am I going to end up? Because that helps us unpack some of the consequences of our worldview and what we do with Genesis 1. 
You'll see four very briefly listed there. Uh, look and see how the scriptures use this account of creation. Here's the foundation of God's authority. He's the creator. When Jesus is asked a question about marriage and divorce, where does he go? Genesis. When Paul is asked a question about why Jesus died on the cross and where history is going, where does he go? Genesis. In fact, when Paul is asked about how should I run a church, what should the order of church be and what about services, where does he go? Genesis. You see, if you start messing around here, what are you going to muck up here? How about the way in which this area helps us touch on areas of Christian teaching, doctrine, if you like? Here are some of the ones I came up with as you look at the Bible. Why Jesus died on the cross? Why Jesus took on flesh? What is sin? Who is God? What's the future hold? What's worship mean? What's work? What's rest? What's marriage? What's salvation? Who am I as a human? Who am I as a man? Who am I as a woman? How do men and women relate? What's the purpose of humans? They're big topics, aren't they? If I muck this up, where do I end up? What about the purpose of Scripture? We know that verse, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training to prepare us for good works. What have we been taught, maybe rebuked on, corrected, trained in, so that we can find the good works? You see, if I muck this up, what am I being rebuked on or corrected in or trained in? In fact, what do my good works look like? Finally, what does this mean for tomorrow? Uh, Church is great, isn't it? We've all sat and we've opened the word of God, we're we're singing songs together, we're praying, we're catching up with people we haven't seen for a while. That mightn't be tomorrow, might it? You'll go out from a group of like-minded people and you'll go to work or you'll spend time in your family or you'll go to leisure. You'll tell some jokes. You'll share the telly shows you watched. You'll make a decision about your priorities. Why is it so? Why'd you make that decision? Why'd you tell that joke? Why'd you laugh at that joke? Why are you planning to be at church on Sunday next week? Maybe youth group, maybe Bible study group. What did you read today? Why'd you talk to that person? Why didn't you talk to that person? Why is it so? Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, There is just so much here and we've probably only scratched the surface. Father, help us to think deeply on your word and help us to apply it, help us to think through it, help us not to neglect it. Father, help us to think on our worldview, on the way in which we navigate the world, on your worldview and what you call your people to hold as the map for this world. In Jesus' name, amen.